does it make a difference whether your teacher believes that you are a high performer or a low performer, that you are a late bloomer, that even though you haven't demonstrated your intellectual ability, you know, you, you will blossom, uh, or you're not a good student or you're a good student. Psychologist Robert Rosenthal and school principal Lenore Jacobson did a remarkable study some years ago in which they told school teachers, elementary school teachers, that on the basis of some uh, psychological tests, some of their ch students, some of the children in their class were designated as late bloomers. Even though they hadn't shown any um, academic uh, success, they are expected to bloom. The amazing thing is that in a very short time, the teachers began to treat the children, those children differently than the other uh, kids. Those kids began to think of themselves differently. And in the end, they actually performed significantly better than the other kids. They were transformed by the teacher's positive expectations. The opposite of Jane Elliott's study in which teachers' negative expectations that the teacher infused led them to think of themselves as inferior. So let's see the Pygmalion effect in action in these classrooms set up by Rosenthal and Jacobson. Positive expectations can change a person's perception of a situation just as dramatically as negative expectations. Psychologists call this the Pygmalion effect after the George Bernard Shaw play of the same name in which even an uneducated ragamuffin can be transformed into a proper society lady. In an experiment conducted at an elementary school like this one, psychologist Robert Rosenthal and school principal Lenore Jacobson took the Pygmalion effect one step further. What we wanted to show was the extent to which teachers' expectations could actually affect pupils' intellectual performance, for example, their IQ scores. So what we did was we tested everybody in a school with a test that pretended to be a test that would predict academic blooming, so-called Harvard test of inflected acquisition. And allegedly on the basis of that test, but not really, we gave each of the teachers in the school the names of a handful of children in her classroom that would get smart in the academic year ahead. These kids' names were taken out of a hat. We, we chose them by means of a table of random numbers. The children themselves did not know in any direct way that uh, teachers were holding certain expectations for them. Teachers were told not to tell the kids, and of course we didn't tell the, the children either. So the children never knew. Six times something that's close to 32. Good, six times five. And then when we tested the children a year later, we found that those kids who'd been alleged to their teachers to be showing or going to show intellectual gains, in fact showed greater intellectual gains than did the children of whom we'd said nothing in particular. So the kids actually got smarter when they were expected to get smarter by their teachers. Uh, we've come to feel that there are really four factors that operate in the mediation or communication of these self-fulfilling prophecies, especially in the classroom, but not only in the classroom. So what are these four things that teachers tend to do differently to kids for whom they have more favorable expectations? The first factor is the climate factor. Teachers tend to create a warmer climate for those children for whom they have more favorable expectations. Or it is nicer to them, both in terms of the things they say and also in the nonverbal channels of communication. The other uh, very important factor is the so-called input factor. That one probably won't surprise anyone. Teachers teach more material to those kids for whom they have more favorable expectations. After all, if you think a kid is dumb and can't learn, you're not going to put yourself out to try to teach them very much. Two other factors, though, make a difference. One is the response opportunity factor. That is, kids get more of a chance to respond if the teachers expect more of them. They call on them more often. When they do call on them, they let them talk longer and they help and shape with them uh, the answers that the kids uh, speak out kind of working together to put the response out. The last is feedback. The feedback uh, factor works in this way as you might expect if, 
if more is expected of a kid, the kid is praised more, uh, positively reinforced more for getting a good answer out. But interestingly enough, is given more differentiated feedback when they get the wrong answer. One of the ways in which you can sometimes tell a little bit that the teacher does not have very high expectations for a kid is that the teacher is willing to accept a low quality response or it won't really clarify what would have been a good quality response. Maybe because he or she feels, well, what's the use? The kid's not smart enough to profit from this additional clarification. So those are the four factors, climate, input, response opportunity, and feedback.